and almost live from room 115, it's Miss Sunogo! Dear Juno by So Young Pak, illustrated by Susan Kathleen Harton. Juno watched as the red and white blinking lights soared across the night sky like shooting stars and waited as they disappeared into faraway places. Juno wondered where they came from. He wondered where they were going. And he wondered if any of the planes came from a little town near Seoul where his grandmother lived and where she ate persimmons every evening before bed. Juno looked at the letter that came that day. It was long and white and smudged. He saw the red and blue marks on the edges and knew the letter came from far away. His name and address were neatly printed on the front, so he knew the letter was for him. But best of all, the special stamp on the corner told Juno that the letter was from his grandmother. Through the window, Juno could see his parents. He saw bubbles growing in the sink. He saw dirty dishes waiting to be washed. He knew he would have to wait for the cleaning to be done before his parents could read the letter to him. Maybe I can read the inside too, Juno said to his dog, Sam. Sam wagged his tail. Very carefully, Juno opened the envelope. Inside, he found a letter folded into a neat, small square. He unfolded it. Tucked inside were a picture and a dried flower. Juno looked at the letters and words he couldn't understand. He pulled out the photograph. It was a picture of his grandmother holding a cat. He pulled out the red and yellow flower. It felt light and gentle, like a dried leaf. Juno smiled. Come on, Sam, Juno said. Let's find mom and dad. Grandma has a new cat, Juno said, as he handed the letter to his mother. And she's growing red and yellow flowers in the garden. How do you know she has a new cat? Juno's father asked. She wouldn't send me a picture of a strange cat, said Juno. I guess not, said Juno's father. How do you know the flower is from her garden, asked Juno's mother. She wouldn't send me a flower from someone else's garden, Juno answered. No, she wouldn't, said Juno's mother. Then Juno's mother read him the letter. Dear Juno, how are you? I have a new cat to keep me company. I named him Juno after you. He can't help me weed, but the rabbits no longer come to eat my flowers. Grandma. Just like you read it yourself, Juno's father said. I did read it, Juno said. Yes, you did, said his mother. At school, Juno showed his class his grandmother's picture and dried flower. His teacher even pinned the letter to the board. All day long, Juno kept peeking at the flower from his grandmother's garden. He didn't have a garden that grew flowers, but he had a swinging tree. Juno looked at the letter pinned to the board. Did his grandmother like getting letters too? Yes, Juno thought. She likes getting letters just like I do. So Juno decided to write one. After school, Juno ran to his backyard. He picked a leaf from the swinging tree, the biggest leaf he could find. Juno found his mother, who was sitting at her desk. He showed her the leaf. I'm going to write a letter, he told her. 
I'm sure it will be a very nice letter, she answered, and gave him a big yellow envelope. Yes, it will, Juno said, and then he began to draw. First, he drew a picture of his mom and dad standing outside the house. Second, he drew a picture of Sam playing underneath his big swinging tree. Then very carefully, Juno drew a picture of himself standing under an airplane in a starry nighttime sky. After he was finished, he placed everything in the envelope. Here's my letter, Juno announced proudly. You can read it if you want. Juno's father looked in the envelope. He pulled out the leaf. Only a big swinging tree could grow a leaf this big, he said. Juno's mother pulled out one of the drawings. What a fine picture, she said. It takes a good artist to say so much with a drawing. Juno's father patted Juno on the head. It's just like a real letter, he said. It is a real letter, Juno said. It certainly is, said his mother. Then they mailed the envelope and waited. One day, a big envelope came. It was from Juno's grandmother. This time, Juno didn't wait at all. He opened the envelope right away. Inside, Juno found a box of colored pencils. He knew she wanted another letter. Next, he pulled out a picture of his grandmother. He noticed she was sitting with a cat and two kittens. He thought for a moment and laughed. Now his grandmother would have to find a new name for her cat. In Korea, Juno was a boy's name, not a girl. Then he pulled out a small toy plane. Juno smiled. His grandmother was coming to visit. Maybe she'll bring her cat when she comes to visit, Juno said to Sam as he climbed into bed. Maybe you two will be friends. Soon Juno was fast asleep. And when he dreamed that night, he dreamed about a faraway place, a village just outside Seoul where his grandmother, whose gray hair sat on top of her head like a powdered donut, was sipping her morning tea. The cool air feels crisp against her cheek, crisp enough to crackle. He dreams, like the golden leaves which cover the persimmon garden. ever look at the world around you and marvel at how things work? How do some things move, pull, push, change direction, spin, speed up, or slow down? How do the things we use every day work together to help us solve both simple and complex tasks? This week, we are going to explore the wonders of simple machines. Simple machines can be used to lift loads, cut objects, connect higher and lower areas, and move objects forward. Simple machines are used to change motion and force in order to perform a task. A force is a push or pull on an object. Without force, an object will either remain still or keep moving in the same direction. Force can change the way an object moves or even how it is shaped. You may be familiar with the term domino effect. Without any force, these dominoes will remain still, lined up one after the other. Even though these dominoes are not moving, the simple act of setting them upright lifts them against the pull of Earth's gravity. This allows the dominoes to store a certain amount of energy called potential energy. When the first domino is toppled over, the force of gravity pulls the domino downward which then causes it to crash into the next domino, thus setting off a chain reaction. As the dominoes fall, the stored potential energy changes into an energy of motion called kinetic energy. Some of that energy is transmitted to the next domino, providing the push needed to knock it over. 
Energy continues traveling from domino to domino until the last one falls. This type of chain reaction, along with others, can be observed in a Rube Goldberg machine. A Rube Goldberg machine, named after American cartoonist and inventor Rube Goldberg, is a machine that is purposely designed to solve what are otherwise easy tasks, like pouring a cup of water or flipping a light switch, in a more complicated way. Why would anyone want to make an easy task harder? Well, it can be fun and it's a great way to explore how simple machines can work together to create such a complex system. The chain reactions that occur within a Rube Goldberg machine also help us to better visualize and understand force and motion at work. Take a look at the Rube Goldberg machine designed by these two brothers. Their machine was set up to solve a simple task of moving a gumball into a person's mouth for eating. However, designing the machine to solve an easy task in a more complex way took thoughtful planning and testing of simple machines, like the car ramp, and chain reactions, like the domino effect, to get the gumball off of the table and into his mouth. What other simple machines and chain reactions can you observe in their video? Okay, well, that looks easy enough, right? <laughs> Wrong! Take a look at how many times it took the brothers to perfect their machine to solve the task. Devising a machine to do what you want takes many trials and errors. I'm about to show you the number of times I failed to make my machine work. But I didn't give up and neither should you when you make yours. Let's back up a little though. Back to the very start. I started out with the task that I wanted to solve, a simple task. A friend of mine has a pet dog named Sadie. I observed my friend feeding Sadie every night by taking a scoop of dog food from a bag and emptying it into her bowl. I thought it would be fun to create a Rube Goldberg machine to achieve this same task, feeding Sadie, in a fun and more complex way. Once I knew what task I wanted my machine to do, I created a blueprint a plan of what materials I wanted to use to make my machine, and how I would use these materials to work together to solve the task. This is how my first blueprint looked. Is that written in dinosaur? I can barely read it. Hey, I didn't say it had to look pretty. I knew Sadie eats her food in the kitchen, so I knew I would have to set up my machine in that area. Before I started running around grabbing random materials from around the house, I had to think about how I wanted to solve the task. I built my plan by working backwards. For example, I knew that something had to trigger the cup spilling into the dog bowl. If I attached a string to the bottom of the cup and created a pulley by using the cabinet knobs to change the direction of the cup, pulling it upwards from the bottom where the string is attached, the cup would turn upside down, spilling Sadie's food into her bowl. Step three in the process of designing and making your own Rube Goldberg machine is to set up the machine. I used materials that I had lying around the house. Some examples include cardboard, tape, string, toy cars, ping pong balls, Jenga blocks, and more. You will notice that some of the materials that I end up using when I set up my machine are different than what was in my original blueprint. That's because later on when I start testing the machine, some materials end up not working and others ended up working a little bit better to solve the task. The last step in the process of designing and creating your own Rube Goldberg machine is to test the machine. Now, it takes many, many different trials and errors to get the machine to do what you want. 
Sometimes you have to completely let go of some of the materials that you wanted to use at the beginning in order to make it work. For example, the trigger that I wanted to start the chain reaction of this machine was a ping pong ball floating upwards in a glass container driven by the reaction of baking soda and vinegar. From there, I wanted the ping pong ball to lift up and enter down a ramp that would later start a domino effect with Jenga blocks. As you can see, after many trials, I still couldn't quite get the ping pong ball to rise above the surface, but also for it to have enough force to travel down the ramp. This is a picture of me visibly frustrated after about four and a half hours and 15 plus trials of trying to get my machine to work. I was having a hard time letting go of my desire to use the baking soda and vinegar in this machine and was upset that I couldn't get it to work. After a while, I realized that I had to completely change parts of my plan and when things don't work, don't give up and try looking at it with a different perspective. Now, it's your turn to create your own Rube Goldberg machine at home. Remember the four steps to follow while designing and building your machine. Identify a simple task to solve, create a blueprint to plan your design, keeping in mind the chain reactions and simple machines that you want to use to solve your task, set up your machine, and test your machine. Remember, sometimes you end up having to cut out or change parts of your original plan and modify things in order to make it work. It takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. Don't give up. You are going to create something fascinating and will learn a lot along the way. Don't be afraid to ask someone for help. I asked at least three people for new ideas when I couldn't get my machine to work. And if possible, try working together with someone at home. You never know what you might come up with. Do you have a science experiment idea that you want featured on our show? Send me an email including any videos or pictures of your experiment. Remember, ask an adult for permission first and for help. We received so many responses to the post-it question. Thank you! Before we dive into this week's post a question of the week, let's take a look at what you had to say. And we're back. Thank you again for all of your responses. And now, introducing the post-it question of the week. Here we go. If you could invent something to make life better for others, what would it be? Feel free to draw and label a picture of your invention. Email your responses to me. Please ask an adult to help. 
My email address is msonogo at cps.edu. Looking forward to hearing from you. Wondering what'll we do for this week's workout? I have a quacktastic exercise that fits the bill. Okay, I'm done quacking jokes. Let's get to it. Stand with your feet hip width apart and feet flat on the floor. Keep your chest up as you walk and you can extend your arms in front of you if you need it to balance. Step forward with the left foot, then the right foot, staying as low as you can comfortably go. Well, I hope that last exercise made you so hoppy that you are totally wanting to do more. Start squatting down with your feet a little wider than your shoulders. Put your hands between your legs, kind of like a frog, and then jump forward and upward, softly landing back in your original frog position. So I'm going to show you two of my favorite skills at home. My first one is drum roping but I always do it outside because there are breakables inside. I like to do fun things with this jump rope, like this. I like to do crossing very much. Now my second thing is bubble breathing. I like to have my bubble that has, my bubble um, thing that has my name on it. I turn, I open it and I get some bubbles on it and I like to breathe gently into it like this. And it also is a very fun thing to do because you can blow bubbles. And it's always fun to pop those bubbles if you have a sibling or someone staying to visit. Bye. Hello everyone! Today I'm going to show you my exercises! They are for stretching your arms. The first one is called elephant ears. I call it that because I, it looks like elephant ears. So first you put your hands together, put them on your head like this. Then pull the other, then pull this, the hand that's on your head towards the other hand and then you, and then you rotate that is my first exercise my second exercise is called big muscles i call it that because it looks like big muscles big muscles like arnold first you make fists and go like this and then you push up, down, up, down, up, down, and, and, and it's good, and both of them are very good for stretching your arms. This is my favorite workout, and it's called lock tennis. So there's a line through the middle, and me and my dad each have our own size, and if, if one of us don't kick the ball in one or less shots, um, there's a, it's a point for the other person, or if it doesn't pass your side. And right now it's me and my dad. Do you have a workout of the week that you want featured on our show? Record a video of your workout. Remember to ask an adult for permission first and for help. Looking forward to working out with you. Taki, what you doing? Oh my goodness, I have been baking non-stop for 48 hours. 
Talkie, that is a long time. Have you had any chance to rest? No, I don't have time to rest. Listen, I have only 25 of these cookies left to eat, okay? But I gave away 62 of them to friends. So I'm having a little bit of trouble figuring out how many I baked to start with. I have 25 left, but 62 are gone. How many cookies did I bake? I'm going crazy! Okay, calm down, Toggy. We'll ask the mathematicians, okay? Okay, guys, once again, I implore you for your help. How many cookies did I bake at first? I gave away 62 cookies. I have 25 of these yum yums left. But how many did I start with? Please help. Thank you. Do you have a solution to our math problem of the week? Email me your response. For a bonus challenge, is there more than one way to solve the problem? I can't wait to hear from you. Remember last week's math problem? Well, Chucky and I received an overwhelming response from viewers just like you. Let's take a look at your different solutions and ways to solve the problem now. It's time for Talkie the Talking Triceratop. Wait, that's too long. Triple T time. Yay! Don't play up. Uh, why did the student eat her homework? Uh, because the teacher said it would be a piece of cake. Get it? Piece of cake? Ah. Knock, knock. Who's there? Nacho. Nacho who? Thanks for watching. Love, Miss Sonogo. And time.